Hannah's very impressed so far with this recording. Yeah, we know what good. we're doing. We're professionals. We will fi- and we will fix it in post. So it's Friday. Nothing is meant to work on a Friday. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Take two. I'm Richard Delavan. And I'm Claire Brady. And this is Wicked Problems, for real this time. How can we accelerate the development and deployment of climate tech? Oxfordshire is this hotbed of innovation. They've got like a whole energy tech cluster there. Lots of interesting stuff happening in space tech, which has applications to climate tech as well. Supporting those early stage startups and scale ups to access the funding or access the new connections, the pilot opportunities, the corporate licensing opportunities, the academic partnership opportunities, all of those good things, and convening people in the ecosystem, the climate tech innovation ecosystem, bringing them together and basically allowing brilliant and wonderful things to happen in that space. With everything happening, or not happening, in Dubai right now, as negotiations are deadlocked, we thought it would be a good time to take a step back and realize that the hard work of climate tech is happening because of what people are doing around the world, not just in a conference room in the UAE. To take just one example, in the 12 days of COP28, the world will likely have seen somewhere between 11 and 13 gigawatts of solar PV capacity installed. That's more than all that was installed in 2010. We recorded this conversation with Hannah Scott of Oxfordshire Green Tech for just this moment. We recorded on a Friday when things looked a bit more optimistic for the outcomes from COP, but we wanted to release it now to remind us that no matter how things end in Dubai, more people more capital, and more technology are being deployed than ever before in moving things in the right direction. Hannah has forged a network of some of the brightest climate tech innovators, not just around Oxford, but with the climate tech supercluster, has connected them not even with Cambridge and just other parts of the UK, but further afield in France, Belgium, and the Netherlands. So have a listen to Hannah Scott and Claire Brady and myself, hear that enthusiasm, take a bit of heart, and book your early bird ticket for the Oxfordshire Green Tech Climate Solutions Conference. You'll find that in the show notes. And now here's our conversation. Hannah Scott from Oxfordshire Green Tech, thank you so much for joining us. How are you today? Yeah, I'm good. We're all in Friday mindset, all uh, a little bit of a foggy brain, but I think we're mostly plowing on. We're getting there. So yeah, happy to be here today. (laughs) Excellent. So for those listeners who are not familiar with Oxfordshire Green Tech, maybe tell us a little bit more about the organization. For sure. So Oxfordshire Green Tech is a business network. Our sort of tagline, if if you like, is a business network for a low carbon future. And so much of what we do focuses around how can we support the low carbon economy's growth? And much of that does focus specifically on climate tech innovation. So supporting those early stage startups and scale ups to access the funding or access the new connections, the pilot opportunities, the corporate licensing opportunities, the academic partnership opportunities, all of those good things, and convening people in the ecosystem, the climate tech innovation ecosystem, bringing them together and basically allowing brilliant and wonderful things to happen in that space. And it's a real honor in particular working in Oxfordshire when we've got two powerhouse universities Oxford University itself being um, the leading UK university for spin outs. Um, and we're just seeing more and more climate tech focused organizations coming through and reaching out to us for support. And also from further afield as well. You know, we've got members from outside of the county as well. So it's a real honor to be leading that network. And in fact, even beyond the county, I mean, there's something that you're also connected with, which is the Climate Tech Supercluster, which involves people and companies from even beyond these shores. So maybe can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So as a bit of context, Oxfordshire Green Tech has a sister network called Cambridge Clean Tech. And we've been working across that sort of Oxford to Cambridge region for, well, ever since we first launched, Cambridge Clean Tech actually helped us in that launch period. And we've been working together closely ever since. And we've been looking at the climate tech space and thinking to ourselves, climate tech is, it's a more of a horizontal than it is a vertical. You know, it's so broad. It really does attack all areas of society from transport to energy, materials, um, and even, you know, thinking about a circular economy rather than a, a linear economy and the ways that technology can contribute to that. But it's very disaggregated. If you went to Cambridge, for example, looking as a corporate for solutions to all of your sort of innovation needs or your decarbonization needs, you might not find everything that you need within Cambridge itself. 
but you might find it if you looked at Oxford, at Cambridge, at the paris saclay region, looking over to Rotterdam, to the Netherlands, and further afield. And so what we're trying to do with the Climate Tech Supercluster is essentially bringing together a geography, a functional economic area that exists within a four-hour train journey of London, where we're aware there are several sort of climate tech hotspots within this region. And we're trying to coordinate that a bit better, make that more coherent and open up the shop window as well for climate tech, um, because it is a rapidly growing vertical in the investment space and it is performing relatively well um but we want it we want it to succeed even further basically and using our sort of collective uh savvy in this space using the sort of um connections we have across this space with other cluster regions thinking about how can we draw this ecosystem in a together in a way that accelerates the investment into the development of and the deployment of climate technology at speed and scale as you say i mean even though it was uh, not a great year over the last 12 months in terms of overall VC investment in Europe. I saw this morning that one out of every four pounds invested by venture in Europe went to climate tech over the last 12 months, which is quite something. And so it's a great you know, time, I think, for people getting into the space and for investing in the space. Mm. And you guys are, are sponsoring or leading a conference that's coming up in March, which people can now start signing up for. Maybe tell us a little bit about that. Absolutely. So that's uh, our Climate Solutions Conference. Um, that will be happening in Oxford at the sort of prestigious Said Business School, which is part of the University of Oxford. Um, and it's really going to be a day that's full of multiple different ways of tackling the sort of climate problem, if you like. So we've got a strand that's focused entirely on climate innovation, and we've got a strand that's focused on sustainability and a sustainable transition. And within the climate tech innovation uh, space, we have several sort of pitching sessions where we're hoping for, you know, predominantly Oxfordshire based startups and scale ups who are looking for funding around the sort of pre-seed and series A stage to step up and present about their business and what they need. We've also got a panel which does ask that question, how can we accelerate the development and deployment of climate tech? And we've got a number of really great speakers on that panel. We've got representation from the corporate space with the sort of head of net zero innovation at EDF. We've got Oxford University Innovation there. So they are the tech transfer office for the University of Oxford. And they're the people who are seeing more and more of those spin outs that are more focused on climate tech coming through. We've got a speaker from the startup space who is TBC, but hold your, what's the word? Keep your eyes peeled for who that speaker will be. And we've got an IP firm as well who realize that IP is a crucial part in the toolkit of protecting, you know, what you're doing as a climate tech SME and, and hoping to scale that up. So it's going to be a really jam-packed day. And of course, loads of networking throughout the day as well. Loads of opportunities to see what else is happening in this space and to connect with others. And I think I love putting on events like this because the conversations you can have are so unexpected sometimes. You go to a conference expecting to meet a certain kind of person, and you do, but then you also meet other people who are working on technologies you never even thought were possible, and yet they're proving it at the concept level, and they're, they're growing and they're dynamic, and it's just a really great space to be part of. So tickets are available for that, and we'd love to see as many people there as possible to bring the strength of Oxfordshire to the wider world and to see what we can achieve together, basically. Thanks, Hannah. That's really interesting. And it sounds really exciting. I'm going to be putting a date in my diary, see whether or not I can come along. But <laughs> as I was saying to Richard, Richard knows this, but you and I go way back. And I was actually trying to work out in my brain when we first met, because it was right at the earliest inception of, of Oxfordshire mm. Green Tech. And I just wondered if you could perhaps talk a little bit about that, how the network came about, and a little bit around that evolution, because, you know, we're seeing so much changing in the sector. And it'd be interesting to hear how has that affected the network, how it's evolved over time to meet the needs of different types of companies, particularly, as you say, more and more companies are spinning out of, of universities into this sort of space. So just be great to get a little bit more of that history. Yeah, for sure. And, and Claire, to a certain extent, you know that history even better maybe than I do. Uh <laughs> 
Yeah, the, the history is a really interesting one, actually. So it first came about as part of an ERDF funded program called Ox Futures, which was all about supporting and growing the low carbon economy in Oxfordshire. And the organisation I and Claire used to work for, via Regional, which is a sustainability charity and consultancy, was involved in that consortium of partners who were working on that bigger Ox Futures programme. And part of that programme was to establish this business network that would continue that legacy of climate innovation and climate action far after the sort of bids money or the sort of programs money had come to an end from the European Union side of things. And so Bioregional were the kind of lead on creating that network, establishing what it looks like, launching it, running events, doing the logistics. And I actually joined Bioregional kind of as a junior officer to help that become a reality. So I wasn't really involved in the strategic planning of that network very much at all from the beginning. I kind of got launched into it from the frying pan into the fire kind of style. And I remember thinking when I first joined Bioregional that that sustainability was my first love. And I was really interested in working with community action groups or with local authorities or whatever. And I was less interested in working with businesses because my experience of businesses to date had been large corporates, greenwashing, saying that they were doing good things for the environment, but not really doing anything. And that was my conception of what business was like. And so I had this real ingrained, I guess, I don't know, dislike of business or maybe a slight cautiousness about it. And then when we started the network and we started talking to the businesses that wanted to be part of this network, my reality was completely shifted. And I realized that there were several great businesses out there that were doing things that were good for their business, but also good for people and good for the planet. And it it was those kind of businesses that we really wanted to support and those kinds of innovations that we saw needed that help, that those connections, that funding opportunity, those sort of mentoring experiences as well. And so we had a year of that sort of European funding. And in that time, we had to get enough critical mass, I guess, of membership to to make the organization fly on its own two feet. I'm mixing metaphors there, but go with it. (laughs) And then, yeah, it's ever since it's been this really interesting combination of membership that sort of keeps us afloat and membership of different levels so that we can allow those small early stage businesses to be a part of the network as much as larger corporates and professional services and local authorities. So a mixture of that, but also project work and consultancy work and getting involved in really interesting, innovative consortium bids and programs that help encourage innovation in a more strategic way for the county. So that's been a real interesting shift over time and I think it's helped us in many ways because we're not just a collection of businesses we ourselves have expertise that we would like to bring to the table when thinking about how we can create a more sort of smart and low carbon future for Oxfordshire so yeah it's been a great journey and here I am (laughs) as chief exec having started out at a very junior level worked my way up so to speak and just fallen in love with the membership, the people who are part of it, and just wanting to help them more and more, basically. So yeah, that's a little bit of history, maybe too much history, but (laughs) yeah. That's really interesting to hear, Hannah. And obviously, uh, you know, you know, I know some of that, but it's great to hear you talk about that. And you, I think one of the things that makes these networks work is having someone who's genuinely interested in each of the different businesses. But there was something you talked there about the role that as a sort of network that you play in almost educating and upskilling some of the other organizations whether that's local authorities when they're trying to look at the lens of how do we solve a particular challenge so perhaps you could maybe explore a little bit about how that role works because as you said earlier you know you've got this disparate set of organizations no single organization can solve all the problems in any particular geographical area so a lot of this is around that matchmaking and that sort of preparing the ground for someone to see the value that Mm. a particular business might be able to play and open up their eyes to a different way of thinking so have you got examples in that of where you've been able to help sort of almost make the case for a a slightly different way of doing it that, that enables a business to find a route to market yeah that's a great one and I think so 
Cambridge Clean Tech, who have been around for maybe a little over a decade, I think 12 years, have certainly got many like case studies on a more international scale that they can talk to. And that's because of their sort of innovation search or meet the buyer program that they're doing. And, and we're doing that as well in Oxfordshire too. But they have basically had this contact with corporates who are looking for solutions and then they've undertaken this search so you know let's say for example Shimizu is a Japanese corporation in the built environment sector and they reached out to Cambridge Clean Tech saying hey you know we want some innovations around transport mobility logistics who do you know and then we were able to do that kind of search function for them to shortlist to triage those businesses to understand which ones are worthwhile talking to and then to present them to that corporate and as a result a, a deal was struck between them and an organization called Oxto who I think actually started in Oxford which is fab and there's a, a flywheel technology provider and on a similar sort of note because of our connectivity to local authorities especially in Oxfordshire, most of them are members of our network. So we're very well connected with them, especially with the sort of economic development offices within each of those organizations. It means that when, when we onboard new climate tech SMEs, often they'll be saying, hey, you know, we've done a sort of a, a small stage proof of concept. We're looking to scale, but we're looking for pilot opportunities. We're looking for demonstration opportunities. And for example, there's a, a new member who's joined recently who has got a patented wind turbine that is the size of a small table. And its use case is on the top of a multi-story building or on motorways where the wind from passing cars is enough to generate energy. And so they were saying, you know, can we get connections into local authorities who have ownership over tall buildings and tall car parks, because there are several around the county that the council, that various councils own and can agree to. And so I think conversations are underway on that. And hopefully we'll see a pilot project coming out of that, which would be really exciting. So yeah, it's kind of, when it comes to the matchmaking element, it does tend to be those larger organizations that own the assets. They they own the, the rights to their land or their assets being used in a certain way. And by coming to them and saying, we've got this person working in, you know, wind energy, but it can be applied in this way. Or we've got someone who's got a transport opportunity for you. Maybe think about integrating that into your EV strategy, for example, because it's a different type of EV that's, you know, it's more easily rap rapidly charged or it's um, better suited to Oxford's tiny medieval streets, <laughs> uh, whatever that might may be. We do a lot of that in terms of facilitated introductions but a lot of it is events as well it's giving our members the opportunity to share what they're already doing and to bring people into that space to hear about that so it's that sort of knowledge transfer element as well that that comes into a lot of our events cool thank you that was really interesting and so if you were going to say you know compared to where the network was what, five odd years ago when it was first really starting out what do you feel you're looking to try and achieve you know you're part of this european supercluster you know what's the sort of the, the, the big goals that you've got in your mind for oxfordshire green tech and then as part of that supercluster you know what does success look like over those next few years for you yeah i mean it's a great question and i think a lot of it will be attacking various stages of transformation so if there's groundwork to be laid in terms of you know thinking about the key institutions in the county and thinking about their readiness to accept innovation into the ways that they operate or into their existing assets or, or their supply chains or whatever it is so there's some that there's like that kind of awareness raising element that we want to do more of there's the piloting that we want to do more of as well helping our members to get those opportunities to demonstrate what they're doing Success for me also looks like seeing organizations that started out in Oxford or in Oxfordshire rapidly growing, getting that investment in, you know, expanding their operations, expanding their workforces, establishing, you know, other locations around the UK, even maybe further afield. So that internationalization process as well, success would really, I, I would love to see more internationalization of the businesses that we support and seeing the impacts that their technology can have further afield. So that's an element as well. I think our sort of, our, our local authorities are quite sort of, what's the word? They, they are innovation ready in many senses, like they are 
interested in having these conversations, they know that Oxfordshire is this hotbed of innovation. And so a lot of them are kind of open to thinking about that when they're writing transport strategy, when they're writing planning strategy. And so I think what I'd like to see more of is more of that integration, more of that, I guess, two way communication channel existing between ourselves and these institutions that physically own a lot of the spaces that exist in Oxfordshire mm. and seeing the transformation of those spaces, you know, seeing if we can make every ro roof be a, a solar roof or a green roof or a combination of both, you know, seeing how we can create these sort of local mobility hubs that don't rely on every single person having an EV, but do rely on every person having a way of making a journey, whatever size, being a low carbon one, a smart one, um, and, and a healthier one as well, you know, getting us out of that sedentary lifestyle too. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of the Oxfordshire vision, I guess, although it's a bit disjointed. It's it's more innovation, more green. <laughs> I think we can do more of that. I mean, Oxfordshire has a, a net zero target. Oxford City has a very ambitious one of 2040, and they will need innovation to get there. They will need technology to enact that. And so we can partner with them in order to help them do that. And with the super cluster, I guess, yeah, five years time on from here. I mean, I would love to to say that we've got the biggest corporates in this region as part of this, as members who who really are pushing the dial on what sort of good CSR looks like, on what, what integration of climate technology innovation in their organizations can look like, mm -hmm. helping fix those really messy strategic or systemic problems across boundaries across geographic boundaries I think is a really interesting one and I think that's where supercluster might have the most sort of interesting outputs in the sense that it's not just the UK doing a thing it's not just France doing a thing it's those four countries trying to do mm -hmm. that together with an ecosystem of multiple different sectors multiple different sizes of organizations with different capacities and capabilities different levels of dynamism and so I think, I, I mean, I don't know whether to put a, a figure on it. I would love to see, you know, X tons of carbon dioxide reduction by, you know, in five years time. And I don't really know what that number is, but I would love a way of quantifying it. I would love a way of showing that right. actually collaboration has caused that, that change essentially it has enabled more carbon reduction to happen, has enabled more protection of biodiversity and has basically accelerated or created uh, an ecosystem that facilitates the acceleration of climate tech much more than if the supercluster didn't exist at all. Hmm. So we're speaking on the, the first day, officially opening of, of COP28. Um, we've heard this morning the uh, folks from the government on Radio 4 and other places talking about the great British story in climate tech and how great you know progress we've made over the last few years. But I suppose for people working in this space, it hasn't all been smooth sailing. So what, I mean, what are some of the challenges that, as you've worked in this space, you've, your members have seen that they've been able to overcome? And, and what are some of the things that you're seeing coming down the track on that regard? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. So there's the obvious conundrum at the moment around, not, um, yeah, around SaaS models versus deep tech models. I mean, that's a classic, but I mean, do we need both? It's really important to state that we do need both of those kinds of organizations um, because they can mutually enrich each other's offerings. But ultimately deep tech is the technology that's going to cause the carbon reduction at scale that we need. But deep tech is quite an unfriendly proposition to, to a VC, <laughs> to an investor in this space, especially if as an investor, you You've previously invested, you know, maybe in, in edgy tech, maybe in health tech, maybe in agri tech before. And you're now thinking, oh, climate tech, that seems to be an interesting space. And then you get here and you're like, oh, no, you're telling me I need to, you know, front like a huge capex for the rollout of all of these new solar panels. That's not what I signed up for. When, when am I going to get a return on investment kind of thing? So that's something that the community itself is aware of. So I don't know if you've come across green backers before. Robert Hoken of Greenbackers, but he's basically um, a, a guy, a great guy who's come along to a lot of our events and has a platform, a global platform, I believe, for VCs and angels um, investing in climate tech. And he did a great video a few weeks ago, actually it was after one of our clean tech venture days. Um, and he was saying, 
you know, hey, I, I saw these amazing pitching companies at this venture day, fantastic stuff. They all deserve investment. But the reality is they're going to be dead in a year's time if we as an investor community don't start moving at pace mm. with, you know, with deciding on making these deals, with deciding to put in money to these organizations. And there is that sort of, I guess, like dawning realization that when it comes to investment in deep tech, it, it can be risky and is a risky proposition. And we may need to find different funding mechanisms in order to de-risk it to unlock the kind of funding that could really be transformative. Right. So that's definitely one problem. I think the other one is that if you're working with startups, they're people who are highly driven, highly motivated, often extremely intelligent, but not necessarily natural marketers, not necessarily natural communicators. Hmm. And they don't have necessarily the resources and the capacity to put into making a nice website or to put into posting on LinkedIn every single day and getting the visibility out about them. Every SME struggles with this, right? It's always a constraint around personnel, around your time, around your money, around your resources. And so that is something that we have seen a little bit with our members where, you know, we'll put on an event and so we'll be like, I'm so sorry, I'm just absolutely overworked and I, I can't come to this, I can't dedicate time to it. And that's probably not necessarily a thing that's solvable by us alone. <laughs> but I guess what we are trying to do in, our, in the building of the ecosystem that we're doing is trying to access those experts who can help those businesses and can help them maybe put the toe in by offering, you know, a pro bono, like one hour of their time initially, just so that businesses can, rather than thinking, oh, everyone's just out after my money and I don't have enough, I don't have enough to spend on this kind of thing, it's going to have to be pushed down the line. Like trying to encourage that community of support where these organizations can look into these sort of ways of expanding their marketing reach, their visibility or whatever, without necessarily breaking the bank. So that's, yeah, that's another thing. But yeah, and I guess there is this, this, wider acceptance by society now that climate tech is really necessary and that it it is needed and that we need to be doing more to support it but there is still reticence i would mm. say in general there is reticence from larger institutions who maybe maybe are more risk averse than than we would ne necessarily need in these kind of climates i think we need organizations that are more open to piloting to demonstrations and allowing that to happen within their site so that those businesses can get the crucial proof that what they do works which will unlock more funding in the future as well right and another thing we've heard a lot recently is that their founding teams are increasingly looking across, you know, again, not just even to Europe, but beyond looking at incentives that might be there. Is that something you're coming across in terms of trying to retain some of these founding teams who might be finding some of the, the barriers here in the UK a bit frustrating and looking at maybe thinking the grass will be greener across the other side of the Atlantic? Yeah, super interesting one. I know, for example, that there are definitely constraints in Oxford in terms of space that often push sort of deep tech organizations with larger and ever increasing manufacturing capabilities elsewhere, just because Oxford City as a space is quite constrained. There is work that's happening there to expand new sort of science and business parks. Actually, there's loads of expansion happening in that regard within Oxfordshire more broadly. I mentioned earlier in our pre-conversation that, you know, Harwell and Harwell Science and Innovation Campus is in Oxfordshire. They've got massive expansion plans to almost double the personnel capacity that they can have on site. And Harwell is doing incredible things in terms of um, a green ammonia demonstrator. They've got like a whole energy tech cluster there. Lots of interesting stuff happening in space tech, which has applications to climate tech as well. So there, there's lots happening in terms of expansion of these sites where businesses like climate tech innovators might want to set up residence. And I know that lots of our innovators also look to Innovate UK for grant funding, and that is a good incentive. And I think that Innovate as it's, and I wouldn't want to speak for them in terms of their own internal strategy, but we are seeing lots and lots of grants coming out at the moment that are geared towards net zero innovation. And so that that will likely help as well, although you've got to take grants with a pinch of salt they aren't just free money but certainly that will be helping certainly at the early stages as well pre equity financing for some of those startup organizations but yeah like i think 
it, it is there there is maybe a question around you know the UK's ability to continue supporting climate tech I think we we are fairly strong on it well we're very strong on it but you know if we're going to talk politics then we also need a, a national government that also you know has a clear vision on the net zero target that we need to achieve that's legally binding by 2050 and therefore a climate tech strategy that will support those um, businesses giving them confidence that they can remain in the UK that there will be future policy future enabling regulations future enabling funding and other sort of initiatives that will help their continued growth rather than confusing them and and making us think, oh, no, actually, this is being pushed further down the line. Maybe this isn't the kind of an enabling Mm. environment that I want to be part of. So it comes from national policy as well and that directional incentive. Right. I think what would also be interesting to understand better is over the time that you've been working with Oxfordshire Green Tech, you mentioned space tech, you mentioned a couple of other sectors. Are you seeing any differences in the types of member organizations that are coming forward, becoming members of your network compared to when you first started? Is there something different now from maybe a couple of years ago? Yeah, I think that is fair to say, yes. I think initially we had, so, and it it kind of, it's really interesting how these things work out because if you had a completely blank slate, we were if we weren't known to anyone in Oxfordshire before we began, we just set up as a climate tech network. I reckon we would have had very different people who joined us initially. But as it was, the leading organization who set up this network, as I mentioned before, was Bioregional. And Bioregional has a lot of expertise in the built environment space. And so because of the personnel that were based in Oxfordshire from Bioregional, they had lots of connections with people in the built environment, in the zero carbon housing space. And so we were getting quite a few members joining us who had products that were specifically for the built environment. Um, And that's absolutely right. The built environment needs to decarbonize. It needs innovation. Absolutely. But we kind of over the years now, we've been, I guess, like shifting, broadening, whatever you like. We're seeing lots of energy focused organizations coming through. So I mentioned that that wind turbine organization, that's definitely the case. We're also seeing a lot of people in the sort of inorganic chemistry space coming through as well. People looking at chemical recycling, for example, people looking at how uh, at the sort of nano level, we can be shifting materials so that they are recyclable or creating new materials so that we don't even have to rely on plastic in the first place. And there's lots of research and lots of strength, particularly in Oxford University and Begbrook Science Park around that sort of nano level chemical engineering, you could call it. So I think it it really, it kind of depends on who we're reaching out to or like rather it's been We've seen a shift as we've expanded, as we've made more connections with science and business parks, as we've made stronger connections with Oxford University Innovation, the University of Oxford Brooks and others. So it's quite interesting seeing the little pockets that that happen, like the different expertise areas within the county. In the north, for example, in in sort of Vista region, that's pretty strong for the automotive sector. There's a company up there called EVE or EAV. They have an incredible sort of e-cargo bike, which is being rolled out all over the world now. Like Amazon uses them, DPD, like at the NHS. So there's like real pockets of stuff that happen across the county. And we're seeing more of that range, I think, over time. Cool. Well, actually, I have a sort of a question, but I'm going to segue it into two different questions because I wanted to, to step back a little bit back to what you were saying about whether or not we have the right sort of policy and legislative environment for businesses to thrive. You know, we don't want this sector to be to, to almost wilt away. So this mm. the question there around, is there a role perhaps through the super cluster, but also individually for, for OG and, the, and, and, and Cambridge Clean Tech in terms of that advocacy piece, particularly if we are thinking we're going to have a, a change in government over the next sort of 12 months or so. So there's that question. But Related to that, and as you know, hearing you talk about how the membership has evolved, it got me thinking, are you starting to think in terms of thematic clusters that are focused on particular challenges? So mobility, you know, the movement of goods and people, 
energy, you know, whether it's, as you say, in organic chemistry, the sort of, you know, is that starting to be something where you are more, more strategic? So I suppose I'm asking you two questions at once, which is really <laughs> difficult. So choose which all that you want to address. I think, <laughs> I think in a way they are interlinked because yes. from a policy and legislative framework, we need yeah. to be thinking about those key issues. And actually there's a huge interconnection between our future energy system and our future transport system when yeah. it, when we're looking at things like vehicle to grid and, and mm. that. so yeah something there around sectors and advocacy nice yeah absolutely so I'll, I'll tackle them in order because otherwise I'll forget um, <laughs> but yeah definitely with the super cluster that is something we're considering because at that scale that has a lot of advocacy power behind it so initially we set up the, the super cluster with the, the thinking that initially it will be business driven. You know, our founding members, one of our founding members is EDF, for example, and they see the sort of business opportunity in this space so clearly. But we're thinking that as we scale, it becomes more of an economic development opportunity. It becomes more of a sort of policy advocacy opportunity as well. And that's come out loud and clear when we run stakeholder engagement events around the super cluster. So at our most recent Clean Tech Venture Day, we had two roundtables. We had one roundtable on this, the super cluster and getting people from around that um, geographical space and from different class, different sectors to, to talk on it. And there was the other roundtable was on the hydrogen economy. So kind of alluding to your second question there, that sort of like specific vertical on hydrogen. And what came out of the supercluster roundtable was that people were rightfully or, or rightly interested in the sort of business opportunity that the supercluster provided. But several people said, hey, how can we use this to argue for better policy at a wider level? How can we use this as an advocacy block, so to speak? So there's definitely appetite from within our stakeholder group to do that kind of thing. And I think that will happen as we develop this cluster more, as we onboard more organizations, as we help them to better connect with each other, understand each other's pain points, and therefore know what kinds of policy to be recommending or asking for when it comes to approaching policy setting organizations. So absolutely, that is on the cards because we see that as a real opportunity to cause change at the policy level. On the sort of like uh, clustering around certain topics side of things. Yeah, absolutely. So, and, and that works for both Supercluster and Oxford Green Tech. So Supercluster is broadly focused on four different areas and that's food, energy, transport and built environment. And Oxford to Green Tech has a number of um, special interest groups as well. And those are, and I'm going to have to remember off the top of my head because <laughs> we've got a few and they're evolving over time, but we definitely have one on circular economy, We've had one before on social enterprise. We have talked about built environment. We've definitely talked about low carbon mobility before. And we've had definitely clustered activities around each of those spaces. Pre-COVID, we worked with Oxford City Council to do a series of business breakfasts that were focused specifically on low carbon mobility and EVs. And that drew together a certain community, which was really helpful. And we were able to have very honest and transparent conversations about these kind of topics. I think one of our um, events was called What's the real cost of owning an EV? And we had various people, you know, both from the OEM sector, but also just, you know, one man in his van kind of people like talking about their experience of, of using EVs and just being very honest about how much it costs them to, to do so. So yeah, we definitely are clustering around certain areas. And I think that when you bring in the sort of Cambridge Clean Tech Network as well, that proposition becomes even stronger because then you can start sharing cluster expertise across those two different centers of excellence. And you can, they have, you know, they have their own special interest groups as well. We've collaborated a across a number of different areas too. So we're aware that of like this broad membership base of lots of different sectors that are right to get together because of what you said about transport and energy interconnecting. There's so many other sort of interconnections that can happen across that space, but also having that vertical focus as well means that you can get the sort of depth of information across about something very specific that people are very specifically interested in and maybe have a different kind of conversation. So yeah, we've, we've done that and we will do that because we know that's important. 
Well, Hannah, this has been such a great conversation. Before we let you go, and definitely in the show notes, of course, people will be able to find information about where they can get tickets, early bird tickets for the Climate Solutions event you're putting on in March. So, but we also like to ask our guests about catalysts, things that they might have read or watched or listened to that have influenced them in their thinking about climate tech, or they don't have to be from that space, but you know, have influenced their approach to this work. Anything that comes to mind you could recommend? So many things. <laughs> oh, I should have prepared for this. Um, I think, and this is maybe a bit of a, a curveball because it's not particularly climate tech focused, but it is leadership focused. Mm-hmm. And I guess that's what I've been reading about a lot recently. I am quite young uh, as a, a chief executive. Um, and there's been a lot of sort of imposter syndrome that I've had to deal with as a result of that. Um, so that maybe this is not the most helpful recommendation, but like I really love the works of Brene Brown. And in particular, her book, Daring Greatly, is, yeah, it's, a, it's an excellent book. But I think it's useful for anyone who is a professional working in a space that is often depressing, often, you know, it feels constrictive, it feels not enough is happening quick enough or whatever. And it feels if we make a mistake, then the world's going to fall on our heads. And, you know, it's, it's all terrible. And we should just give up. So I think it's a really great book for that. And I guess like maybe, sorry, this is like a, a bonus second recommendation, but on a similar vein, maybe in particular for women in tech, women in climate, the book Playing Big by Tara Moore, hmm is really great with this concept basically of you know historically women have played small you know we've not gone for that promotion we've not spoken up in a session because we thought we weren't the most educated we've not gone for a job because we didn't think we were the most qualified and Tara blows that all up out of the water and says your skills your talents your unique capabilities are what the world needs don't play small play big for your own sake but play big for everyone else's sake as well and I think it's a really great rallying cry for well especially women in the climate tech space because it can seem a bit isolating at times to play big to bring those big beautiful ideas to the world because we need them so much so yeah I'll go with that well that seems like a perfect place to end it Hannah thank you so much for your time thank you yeah it's It's been been a pleasure (laughs) And yeah. I'm adding that book straight away to my list yes. of things to read. I think that's the perfect <laughs> one for me in the lead up to Christmas. <laughs> perfect. Excellent. Well, listen, thank you again. And we'll have the show notes there you know, where people can find more information about Oxfordshire Green Tech, about the Climate Tech Supercluster, and of course, about this event, which you should all sign up to the early bird tickets for in March, the Climate Solutions event. Thank you, Hannah, for joining us. Thanks for listening to Wicked Problems. And if you like this conversation, please share it and leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. It really helps people find the show. You can subscribe to our newsletter at news.wickedproblems.uk, where you can also find more episodes with Richard Elvin and Claire Brady and all our show notes. And consider becoming a paid subscriber to help support our work. You can also find us wherever you get your podcasts. For now, thanks for listening.